So I'm Tommy Wilkinson. I'm a senior technical advisor at uh, Witt School of Public Health at um, uh, Witt University uh, in Johannesburg, in South Africa. Uh, previously at uh, Eclipso's team at uh, Nice International, uh, now Imperial College, uh, where we developed a lot of the, uh, the IDSI reference case. So uh, I think what I'll do today, I've just got um, 10 minutes, and David's going to be hot on me with, these, uh, with the timing. Um, so I want to give you just a brief idea of the, the approach that we took to the IDSI uh, reference case, uh, and then just go through some of the, the specific principles and some of the, like, the building blocks um, and why we thought the, kind of the key structures were important. Uh, and that should give us a good foundation for, what we're, for the, some of the conversations that we'll be having today. Um, so the original aim, actually, of the IDSI reference case, it wasn't actually to set out and say, look, we need a reference case. Uh, we got approached um, and said, look, Gates Foundation is spending 200, US dollars, uh, 200 million US dollars odd in the six years uh, prior to when we started the study on cost effectiveness analysis. And we really got little idea of, say, the methodological quality um, or the comparability of, of, of what's being produced then. So we'd like some assistance in doing that. So that the initial idea was just how can we improve the quality of economic evaluations that are being produced? And by quality, we meant uh, usability of the intended decision maker. Um, and so uh, we uh, got a lot, of, uh, a lot of different folk together. Uh, we had a large workshop in this, in this building in 2013. Um, and we reviewed the existing reference cases. So looking at the original US panel, we looked at the WHO guidance, uh, we looked at the reference case used by the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, which is where, where NICE International was based. So that's the body that makes decisions for the British NHS. So they're the ones saying, yes, this is funded on the NHS, free at the point of use, or no. So the economic evaluation uh, methodology that they were using uh, was very instructive also. Um, and then we wanted to, through that initiative, we explored the key principles. Um, uh, of an economic evaluation that will be useful for decision making. Um, and so there's a core writing group and, and a, a series of, of stakeholders and over a period of many months and actually years, uh, we came about with the IDSI reference case. Now, when we first uh, approached it, one of the key challenges, and, and this leads to one of the, the, the early questions is, so what, who are we doing this for? If we're, if we're creating a reference case, um, it's, it's going to be different to, for example, the ones used by NICE in the NHS. Uh, we had in the NHS has a known constituency. They have known sort of technology types, and they sort of have known they know how much is spent in the health budget for the for the NHS. Um, so they can be quite prescriptive uh, in how they uh, require the uh, economic evaluation methodology to to be written. Um, but when we looked at the decision makers, so it wasn't just Gates Foundation itself. Gates wanted to 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 use this, these economic evaluations to inform their decisions. Really, they wanted to empower. Um, country governments, uh, ministries of health, ministries of finance to make their own decisions. There's also the partners of the Gates Foundation, such as Global Fund and Gavi, um, and then other regional and, and, and global um, funders. Uh, the investment types as well, it wasn't just, you know, just these individual technologies, uh, they were certainly important, but then there was some public health initiatives and program evaluations and things as well. Uh, and then the constituencies, this is the critical piece. So it, it, um, we wanted to sort of, a, on one level, a global audience. We wanted economic evaluation that informs decisions um, about what should be done uh, globally. We also wanted things uh, to be applicable uh, nationally, uh, regional, and provincial, and even at, at the local level. So that was, that was quite a challenge. Um, so the first piece of work was to look at, OK, what's already going on uh, in the world? And that's in, uh, in terms of economic evaluations. And we had a clear focus on. Gates-funded economic evaluations. Now, I think this is actually a surprise to, to everyone um, that we, we just took a snapshot in just these four program um, areas, vaccines, um, HIV, AIDS, malaria, and TB, um, and we found that Gates Foundation was funding relative, about a fifth of all economic evaluations that we could find from that, from that snapshot. Um, funder was not stated in 16% in or so, so that's a story for another day. Um, but of interest here is, is this picture here, and that there was a real mixed, mixed bag of, of funders doing the rest the funding. So that was a big surprise that Gates was really a leader here. And that, that really gave us a lot of motivation. And that, that said, look, Gates can be the one that, uh, you know, a rising tide raises all, all, all boats. That if, if Gates Foundation is a leader in improving economic evaluation methodology in low middle income country settings, um, that, that'll have a, a, a really good impact um, on the whole science. And I think that's flowed through. And that's the opportunity with the Global Health Cost Consortium and also the Benefits Cost Analysis Reference Case. So that opportunity is, is here. Now, when I was talking about uh, all the different constituencies and all the technology types, um, that challenge meant we had to be a bit sort of innovative about how we would structure this reference case. We couldn't apply just sort of a standardized textbook approach and say, you must do the following things. 
uh, because of the changing context, because of the changing decision makers and, and te technology types. Um, and so that the solution really came about in this concept of what we call the, the building blocks. Okay, and so it's um, these these core principles, it's these universal universal, and they're meant to hold no matter context, no matter the decision maker, no matter the technology types. There was methodological specifications, so they would flow from the principles, um, and they could be tailored to the to different contexts, um, and it also gave them an opportunity for, for being more specific um, and and to ensure comparability, and then then some fairly prescriptive reporting standards. So the principles, the idea is that they would optimize. Uh, the value of economic evaluations um, for decision makers. The methodological specifications provided a minimum standard um, to ensure fitness of purpose uh, and also allowed um, comparability across time and context. Uh, reporting standards, as we would expect, something you know, quite prescriptive, but then it would allow um, transparency um, to come through, and that was one of the major factors that, that did come through in, in the development of our principles. So I'll give you an example here. Um, and so the, uh, the principle on time horizon uh, so it states that the time horizon should be of sufficient length to capture all costs and effects relevant to the decision problem, and an appropriate discount rate should be used. Okay, so it's not taking a uh, numerical position, but it's saying this is the core principle. So no matter the context, technology, or anything else like that, if the, the analyst doing the research and the user, they should say, right, what is the principle between time horizon and discount rate? I want to ensure this principle is being met. The related uh, methodological specification can be a bit more specific and says, right, okay, lifetime time horizon, all sufficient to costs, all relevant um, costs and effects, and an annual discount rate of, of 3%. Now, it allows us to take that position. It doesn't mean that 3% is um, uh, you know, the, the most uh, evidence-based approach that should be taken, but for the purpose of, of comparability, this is the methodological specification. And the reporting standard linked to that um, would say that clearly state the time horizon um, and discount rate used. But this is important as well, and this comes through in all the reporting uh, statement standards, is that um, report any additional time horizon and or discount rate used. And if 3% rate is not used, justify. And so the power of the reporting standards meant that the, the analysts and, and those trying to interpret the, the economic evaluation would have in their mind that the, the analyst is meant to either comply uh, or justify. Okay, so follow what the reference case says, but if you have good reason not to, um, just justify it. It's not, and that, in that approach, try to find a good balance between prescriptiveness uh, and relevance to the, to the context in which the economic evaluation is being undertaken. So I won't go through it in too much detail, but these are all the, the reference case principles. Now, top, right at the top was transparency. And that was actually a surprise as well to the workshop. We asked all the users to get together and say, what are the key principles that you could think? And at the top of everyone's list was transparency. Um, then uh, comparator uh, was, was often a key, a key uh, thing that was discussed uh, at, at length. Um, so comparators against which costs and effects are measured should accurately reflect the decision problem. So a lot of these principles will always go back to the stated decision problems. So say what was, you know, what we're actually trying to solve with this economic evaluation, clearly state that decision problem, and the principles can always link back to that. And ev uh, the evidence principle just simply said everything relevant to that decision problem should be used measure of health outcome, and I'm sure we can have lots of discussions about this, but the measure of health outcome should be appropriate to the decision problem, should capture both positive um, and negative effects on the length and quality of life, and should be generalizable across disease states. Now, the methodological specification for that recommend the quality or the DALI, but the key principle here um, was, was that you could have generalizability and you could capture both these positive and negative uh, effects of quality of life. Um, we had one on, on costs as well, um, uh, ensuring that all appropriate costs are used. Time horizon discount rate, I've mentioned. This issue of perspective, we can get through in, in detail, but it's really about these non-health um, effects and costs associated with, uh, with gaining access to the intervention. Um, and the last, last three here, so uh, plus four, heterogeneity, so all about the subgroupings, how are we going to manage those, how are we going to manage and appropriately characterize uncertainty. And the last two um, are outside sort of the traditional framework, the textbook framework of cost-effectiveness analysis. So this is impact on constraints, particularly budget, budget impact, but also other constraints such as health workforce constraints uh, or maybe um, uh, you know, in institutional constraints that you've got. Um, and then equity came through loud and clear. And actually, the methodological specification we have for equity was the least developed. And that was really just a reflection within the CEA world is that, is that a lot of the, the developers we weren't certain that we could give really prescriptive guidance on how equity should be represented, but it came through loud and clear that equity needed to be represented. I think the statistic was only about a third 
of the existing economic evaluations that we got from the survey really even touched on equity um, considerations. So that came through loud and clear as well. So there they all are uh, in their glory, 11 of them. Um, and I've just starred those, the ones that, that Lisa's um, uh, and the team are looking at, and also the, the costing one, uh, just to note the Global Health Costing Consortium is looking at that one in detail as well. So it's great this can all be all linked up and uh, a lot of consistency together. Won't touch on this too much, but this is what IDSI is looking, looking to do in, in, in use of the IDSI reference case, um, including working with uh, lots of different universities to use uh, in-country uh, applicability and methodological specification, and of course working with, with the, initiative, uh, the existing units. There we are on the website. And I'll just, I'm just going to leave you this and can you indulge me this. I think I've earned one, one, about 30 seconds. Now this motivated IDSI all the way throughout our work. When NICE International came into being around 2008, there was a lot of attention. And it said NICE, so in the NHS is taking its vision around the world. And this idea that the earth is back there and you go to, to a far off land and you promote um, this sort of foreign concept, that really motivated us not to let this come true. That it must be, it must be relevant to the context you're in. You must use the take the local values, local scientific and social values into account and be applicable, not come with some sort of foreign ideas. It motivates IDSI from its beginning to now, and it needs to motivate this, this initiative um, as well. So I'll leave that. Thank you. You guys realize we're sort of playing this by ear while we try and figure out the technology. It's pretty embarrassing. but. Uh, um, I don't think I can get that far that fast. But. Mm. Um, having gone through that, uh, I, I was going to ask sort of where it's going, but you've already mm. answered that. So I think maybe the obvious question is, what would be the the few point, pointers that you would offer to this group mm. based on that experience? Uh, because some of the challenges are similar, but perhaps more yeah. significant, you know, valuation yeah. issues and, 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 and discounting issues and yeah. so on. And, and some of them are, of course, yeah. even more challenging. So yeah. a couple I, I, of pointers, it, maybe. Yeah, I think there was probably uh, two, main, two main things that came through when we were, when we were developing. Um, and one was that um, it needs to be applicable, uh, really, to the, to, the, to the context that we're trying to work in. So if we really are honest and saying, look, we want to inform economic, ec economic evaluation in low-middle-income countries, um, then it needs to have participants from those countries and practitioners uh, from those countries. And linked, linked to that and kind of linked to the, the, the next steps is that um, one of the key things IDSI wants to do is, is apply that in, in local countries. So we're already doing a lot of work in uh, both in South Africa and a lot in South East, uh, Southeast Asia as well, Indonesia and, and others. Um, but just to look at those, those principles and see how we can, we can actually a apply them. Um, noting that it's always it, uh, the reference case will get better as we apply it uh, in the different countries as well. So the, the, the motivation would be, yes, it's good to sit and come up with the best, uh, 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 the best approach, but we need to try that. We need to try that out uh, in, in country. And the, the last bit as well is the IDSI, uh, we w the initial uh, attempt, again, we were saying to, was to uh, raise quality, but it wasn't to seek sort of academic excellence. It was more of a pragmatic approach to inform decision making. Um, so we need to anchor this approach also in decision makers. If decision makers aren't asking for a BCA, um, we want to ask ourselves why is that and how can we improve BCA to make it more relevant to decision makers. We've got to avoid a pursuit of academic excellence um, at detriment of pragmatism. A lot, of you, a, lot of you have, a lot of you have worked with me over the years and you know that I have real trouble being brief. So. Uh, um, the slides that I wanted to show you were the ones that got short and more focused because of all the pressure I got from my friends to be concise. Hopefully these are them. We will see. Um, I am very sorry for all the technical glitches. But thank you, Tommy. I think it was actually nice to have that um, introduction as, as context. OK, so now the clicker's not working. Can you switch the slides from uh, over there? I can't switch the slide. Where do I need to point it? There we go. So uh, um, when I first started working, our, 
our IT guy told me that I had magnetic fingers because I kept crashing computers. So I don't think this is magnetism, but it's clearly, clearly some other sort of problem. Um, so some of what I'm going to say repeats a little bit what you've heard before, but I wanted to sort of bring it all together um, into one place um, to try and frame what it is that we're trying to do. Um, I think that the, um, hopefully it's obvious we want people to do more benefit cost analysis. We want them to do a better job. And we want it to be comparable, like Dean said, at least um, by providing some sensitivity analysis that allows what each of you are doing to be compared to what other people are doing. Um, as Tommy said, the IDSI reference case um, includes a number of principles that apply to any type of analysis um, beyond just economic analysis. Um, you want to be evidence-based, um, you want to be transparent in reporting your results, all these sorts of things, and we're going to carry all those into our work. Um, where we differ is that his refer the reference case that they've worked on focuses primarily on um, CEA when it gets to the details of implementation, and we're going to be focused on that cost analysis. Um, this is a graphic that I like to use a lot. Those of you who've had time to look at the scoping report will recognize it. Um, it's an attempt to provide a sort of simple overview of the components of a benefit cost analysis. I try not to call these steps because we never do these sorts of things sequentially. There's a lot of um, iteration as we learn more. And of course, this leaves out things like clear reporting, assessing uncertainty, those sorts of things. But I thought it might be helpful to show you where we're focused, because it really is in this estimation of benefits. Um, what we are trying to do is switch from the CEA context, where we're using qualities and dollies and other effectiveness measures, to the benefit cost analysis context, where um, we need monetary values. I understand, as I think was said earlier, that CEA is actually moving in this direction by saying that these um, non-health outcomes should be included in the cost measure, um, but we want to push that further here. Um, you'll notice, um, if you look at the agenda, that we are not talking about discounting today. Um, that's intentional. Um, the Gates Foundation has funded a companion project that's being run out of the University of Work York by Carl Claxton. Um, that project has some other goals, too, but uh, a major goal is to uh, think carefully about the basis for developing discount rates in different contexts and also to come up with some specific rates. Um, we will, there's going to be some minor editing of the principles, methodological um, standards and reporting standards that are in the IDSI reference case um, to reflect the benefit cost analysis um, context, but that's, if you look at the scoping report, you'll see that those are fairly simple edits. Um, so I've been doing this stuff for, I think, something like 35 years. Um, I've worked on a lot of guidance documents. I've read a lot of guidance documents. A lot of them sit on the shelf um, gathering dust. And I think the biggest problem is that you know a small group of experts will get together, we'll write the guidance, um, and then we'll you know go on and do the other things we do. Um, so we've tried to, in a sense, invert that process and start by engaging the community right away. It makes for a mess, much messier process, I think, but in the end, we will end up with something that I think is much stronger, much, use, much more useful, and uh, hopefully will address everybody's needs. So we have three phases here, the scoping report um, and this workshop. Um, we, we are collecting comments through our website. Um, we will then have a public workshop in November um, for which we will be developing a series of methods cases papers and case studies that will probe the issues we're introducing today in more detail. Um, then we will be developing uh, final guidance. Um, in the materials that you've seen on the website, I think it shows an April 2018 end date. Um, David has now agreed to extend that, um, so we'll finish up in October 2018, which will help give us more time to get through all these steps. But we are trying to figure out um, lots and lots of different ways to involve you all and other stakeholders to make sure that whatever we come up with is uh, well constructed and useful for all of you. Um, uh, if David, oh I, I think um, if David DeFerranti was here he would have uh, been reminding us that there's the the during stage and the after stage. The during stage is what we're all engaged in now. The after stage is what do we need to do to get the guidance adopted and used. Um, 
And uh, that clearly includes a lot of things like technical assistance training, uh, further development of methods. Um, the scoping report is available online. I think uh, Christine may have copies printed if anybody needs them. Um, there is a form online where we hope you'll submit comments. There's, it's not going to be possible to go over all the details of that today, but we uh, do hope that you will read it carefully and let us know um, what you think. Um, we have some sense of the methods papers that we're likely to be drafting, but uh, we'll be formulating that in more detail as we see what sorts of comments we get on today's presentations and on the scoping report. We know we need to look at the VSL, the evaluation of mortality risk, the evaluation of morbidity risk. Um, Carl's group will be looking at discounting, um, but uh, there's a lot of other things that we could address that we'll need to sort through and decide what uh, should take priority. Um, case We'll be doing a couple of case studies ourselves, but we're hoping that all of you who are working on, um, on cost-effectiveness analysis or benefit-cost analyses will also um, help us out by using some of the initial recommendations in your, your work and telling us how well and how useful you find it. Um, the reference case guidelines will probably take several forms, a journal article, um, simple um, <coughs> simple instructions, um, but it will be a supplement. We're hoping to end up with something that is uh, uh, very straightforward and easy to use. We know that in the near term we will be making recommendations about what to do with the existing research um, with appropriate characterization of uncertainty um, and also be identifying priorities for next steps. Um, I think you've all met us, I hope. Um, this is our advisory group, uh, most of whom are here today, um, at least as of May 11th. We also have some people involved ex officio in order to keep us connected to some of the other projects as well as to the Gates Foundation, obviously. Um, the uh, scoping paper um, talks about current practices. It basically says there's a lot of guidance out there. Um, they're in agreement on basic principles, not so much on the details, and they don't address these low and middle income settings that were of interest for this project. Um, but also that benefit cost analyses tend not to follow um, these guidance documents. They're sort of all over the place. Um, we also talk a little bit about challenges that don't have to do with so much the technical detail of the benefit cost analyses, but have to do with people's resistance or inability to do benefit cost analysis. For example, you might have uh, concerns about placing monetary values on outcomes. Um, you might need more training, technical assistance, that sort of thing. Um, we are running an online survey to try and collect more information on this. Um, as of when I left Boston, we had 64 responses. Um, the link is still online, and we hope that uh, you all will contribute. Um, the Work we've done so far suggests that there is general agreement on the basic framework. Most people see benefit cost analysis as a source of information to support decision making. They don't think it's the only thing we should be thinking about when we make decisions, but they think it's very important. Um, it's very clear that um, we need um, <coughs> more agreement on how to evaluate the existing empirical literature on the VSL and how to adapt or adjust it to apply it to different settings. For mortality risk, there's very little uh, willingness to pay research, even in high income settings. So there's a lot of questions about how to apply that research and when to use uh, different types of proxies. Uh, for non-health outcomes, it's hard to come to any sort of conclusion without deciding what outcome you're actually trying to value. And we'll talk more about that later this afternoon. Uh, for discounting, um, most, but not all, analyses are using 3%, but there is a sense that we need to think more carefully about um, what the basis is for um, those values and also what to do if you've got uh, effects that are intergenerational versus intragenerational. And finally, um, every single guidance document that uh, we've read um, talks about the importance of uh, providing information on the distribution of the effects. You know, do the benefits mostly accrue to the poor, to the rich? What about the cost? Um, and not 
just in low and middle income settings, but also in the U.S., we very rarely find that people adhere to that guidance. So I think this is an area where it's not so much the development methods, but just trying to get people to supplement their analyses by reporting this information. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks, and thank everybody for coming. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the underlying concepts and framework for benefit cost analysis. What's, what is it that we're actually trying to do? This is an outline of what I want to get through. The overall objective, the two key elements that are fundamental to what BCA is, and then something about how we measure monetary values conceptually and empirically. The overall objective of benefit cost analysis is to determine whether a policy is efficient, allocatively efficient, economically efficient. What efficiency means here is that it produces the largest possible benefits given the resources that are consumed. And the idea is if the value of the benefits exceeds the value of the resources consumed, then in principle, everybody could be better off if benefits are distributed appropriately. What are benefits? One way to say this is they are the improvement in well-being as evaluated by the people whose well-being is affected by that. And then the costs are actually opportunity costs. They are the benefits that are foregone by using resources for this policy rather than using them in some other way we could have used them. So essentially the costs are a measure of the benefit of what we give up by putting resources into the subject policy rather than putting them to some other use. Uh, as has been mentioned, there are two fundamental steps in economic evaluation of policy. The first is just predicting what the consequences of the outcomes will be. That's obviously essential to any kind of procedure that's based on evaluating consequences. The second, which is where BCA really comes into play is evaluating the outcomes. And economic evaluation broadly sort of comes out of a utilitarian calculus idea where it tends to focus on doing the most good for the largest number of people. That raises two critical questions. What is good? How is that defined? How is it measured? Who gets to judge what is good? And secondly, the interpersonal comparison problem when is it justified to adopt a policy that does good for some people at the cost either of harming others or at a minimum of foregoing the opportunity to provide benefits to those other people? So the two key elements of BCA are answers to these two questions, not the only possible answers, but they are specific answers. So on the first, BCA rests on the idea that the individual affected individual is the best judge of his or her own interests. And so monetary values of outcomes are based on individual preference. This is often what's, I mean, this is what is often called consumer sovereignty. And I want to point out that benefit cost analysis is at its heart populist. It rests on the preferences of the affected people, not the preferences of some decision maker, some policy maker, some bureaucrat. The idea of best judge suggests most accurate judge. And we often talk about preferences should be based on well-informed, well-considered judgments. But we all know from personal experience and other reasons that people are not always well-informed and thoughtful about many choices we make. So an alternative interpretation is not that the people are the most accurate judges of their well-being, but at least they're the most legitimate judges of their own well-being. The idea of individual autonomy as being an important value. This raises the question, when we think ju the judgments we're getting from people are not well-informed and reflective, should we adjust those judgments in some way? And that's an open question. OK. Then the harder part, perhaps, is the aggregation across people. When is it permissible to impose harms on some or forego benefits to some to help others? Utilitarian calculus says you add up utility change in the population, maximize that. Prioritarianism is 
a tweak on that where you could give greater weight to people who are starting at a worse off position. They're nice conceptual ideas, but how do you measure utility change? We don't think there's any objective way to measure changes in practice. So who benefits more from $1,000? Who benefits more from avoiding a severe headache? How can you objectively answer that question? For the moment, I don't think we do know how. So that leads us to some practical methods, something we can compare, either things like qualities and dollies or money measures. That gets us to cost effectiveness and benefit cost analysis. So in benefit cost analysis, the fundamental idea is the Kelter-Hicks compensation test. So we have first the idea of Pareto improvement, a change that improves the well-being of some people does not reduce the well-being of anybody is a Pareto superior move. It's largely unobjectionable, but it doesn't go so far. So the idea of potential Pareto improvement is if we have a change and then we imagine redistribution of money in the population, can we convert that change into a Pareto improvement, hypothetically? And that's what VCA is testing for. So let me illustrate here in this graph, vertical axis benefits to some individual or some group A, horizontal axis, another individual or group B. Imagine where the status quo is policy X. So anything that moves us up and to the right is a Pareto improvement. Both parties gain, or at least no one loses. What about policy Y if we're looking at that? A is better off, B is harmed. Is Y better than X? Pareto uh, improvement doesn't answer that question. Y is not Pareto superior to X. Also, X is not Pareto superior to Y. What do we do? Just say we can't rank them? Well, here's where the compensation test comes in. We determine whether, hypothetically, A could pay money to B such that we adopt Y and then pay compensation arriving at point Z, which is Y plus these compensation payments. Z is Pareto superior to X. So the key idea now is because Z exists theoretically, we say that Y is potentially Pareto superior to X, and that's what the efficiency test is about, the compensation test. So that means, in effect, now we can divide this whole plane into two regions, where I have this line with slope minus one. Everything in the red sector is potentially Pareto superior to X, Everything below that sector is potentially Pareto inferior. So by this test, we can actually say quite a lot if you accept the test. OK, monetary valuation. The idea of monetary valuation is the change in wealth that has the same effect on well-being as the change in outcome of question. in question. So there are at least two different possibilities. Think about an improved outcome for the moment. Willingness to pay for the improvement that's the payment or the reduction in wealth that exactly compensates for the change in the outcome, leaving the person no better or worse off. The other is willingness to accept compensation to forego the improvement. That's the increase in wealth that you could receive instead of the improved outcome that leads to the same increase in well-being. So these are two different measures. Uh, we know, I think always, or at least almost always, willingness to accept will be at least as large as willingness to pay. For very, very small changes in outcome, we think they'll be close together. For big differences in outcome, we know they are not close together. And so that means the choice of measure matters to the result of the analysis. And this really shouldn't be a surprise. It's a, um, a reflection of the idea that benefit cost analysis depends on the starting point. And that's essentially a consequence of the RM possibility theorem, which tells us there's no pos perfect way to make social judgments. Let me say just briefly a couple words about empirical methods. We'll hear more about these later. So revealed preferences and studies that use market prices are a subset of revealed preference, stated preference, and experiments. So the idea of revealed preferences is we look at real people's decisions in the real world we assume they prefer the choice they make to the alternatives they reject. 
the strength of that is individuals actually bear real consequences from their behavior. So they have an incentive to think carefully, to evaluate the consequences and the like. The disadvantages are there are many, many goods and services we'd like to value where we don't observe choices from which we can infer these preferences. And also, investigators don't actually know what the individuals were thinking, what alternatives they considered, and the like. Stated preferences are we survey people about hypothetical situations and say, what would you choose among these alternatives? So now we're assuming people actually do prefer the thing they say they would choose. The strength is it's incredibly flexible. You can ask about goods that don't exist. You can also ask the people you care about for the policy in question. And also the investigator knows and can control what the alternatives are, what information the respondents have and the like. The weaknesses are there's no real significant consequence the respondent bears and hence less incentive to choose carefully. And experiments are somewhere sort of in between. They're in a laboratory setting, so they're artificial. There may be real consequences, but they tend to be sort of trivial, small amounts of money consequences. But they have the advantages of stated preference that the uh, investigator can control very much the information and the choices that are available. So let me stop there. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, thanks very much. I'm Mike Pulden from the University of Alberta. I'm a health mm -hmm. economist. Uh, so I think the really challenging intellectual question that we have to address today is not so much whether or not we include non-health outcomes. It's what is the perspective on social choice that we adopt for this? And I notice that the theoretical framework that you have here is solidly welfareist. And not everybody subscribes to a welfareist. There is controversy in the literature about what that perspective should be. And if you look at the frameworks adopted in the UK, Canada, and other countries, they're non-welfareist. You know, they, they do not subscribe to a, a welfareist perspective on social choice. So I'm just interested in what considerations you made about that choice of perspective, whether it be welfareist or non-welfareist, but also listening this morning to the principles that all lives should be equally valued, um, that there's a you know a constrained resource you know that, that that we can't do everything that we'd want to do so that there's a, a clear opportunity cost it seems and also pragmatism the, there's a, a desire for you know pragmatic decisions it seems to me that a non-welfareist framework more naturally fits than a welfareist so I, I I just wanted to know your your opinions on that um, so it's sometimes said <clears throat> benefit cost analysis and other forms of economic evaluation are a tool, not a rule, that the uh, result of a study should not be determinative of the policy that's adopted, in part because the study is imperfect, in part because benefit cost analysis and CEAs conventionally practiced don't explicitly attend, well, they have a specific formulation of how distributional consequences matter embedded in them that is objectionable to many people in many circumstances. Uh, it does seem that welfare consequences are at least relevant, and so the idea they should be dispensed with, many people would object to. But I think in the end, we come down to for social policy, there are a range of somewhat conflicting objectives and no um, ideal algorithmic approach for resolving that. So I, what I was trying to do here is to explain clearly what benefit cost analysis does and what it assumes so we can recognize its strengths, but also its limitations. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. So, um, well, I, I'll have the chance to say a few words later as well. Thank you for, for this one back me. But um, I guess I was, I was rereading an interview that uh, Bill Gates gave to the Washington Post in 2013. He was asked by Ezra Klein, um, well, what about valuing life? And he said, well, there's something we call the Dalit. When you're running a poor country's healthcare system, you can't treat a 
a year of life at being worth, say, more than $200, $300, or else you'll just bankrupt your healthcare system. And then the um, um, interviewer said, but surely that's sort of the akin to a death panel. That's, that's horrible, right? And he said, well, someone in the society has to deal with the reality that there are finite resources and we're making trade-offs. And you must be explicit about that. And I think that's wonderful because it totally does not conflict with the principle that all values, all lives have equal value, and that's commendable. But it also appreciates constraints. So I think going back to the question that a colleague from the foundation asked earlier, who's the client for this? Who's asking? Because I think that the two approaches are complementary. And I wonder if we perhaps could uh, speak a little bit more about who, who, who's asking for these evaluations or maybe asking in the future, uh, who would we want? To ask how, what type of sort of supply and use demand do we want to induce uh, appropriately, and uh, what the purpose of these different uh, approaches are? Because my concern is that if we kill off the dali and the quali because they're not good enough for intersectoral um, allocations, which they were never meant to be good for that anyway, so that'd be unfair to kill them off so early. Um, but if we were to do that, what would the implications be then on universal coverage and the optics of economists? Um, uh, actually coming in and saying, well, actually, we don't, we, don't, we don't care about maximizing health. What do we care about is asking people uh, what prices they place on things themselves, consumers and producers. But we all know, I mean, surely don't want to go back to Arrow and Sen and Stiglitz and, and all these Nobel laureates that said that that's actually um, not appropriate. So I think we need to, 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 both on the method side and then the practical side of who's using this, who's asking for this, be a bit more explicit early on to avoid having to go into discussions with the likes of Paul Farmer or Richard Horton might start tweeting at us. I'm sure we don't want that. Um, let me make two comments. One, the all lives have equal value. There's a terminology issue here. Value means many different things. And in benefit-cost analysis and things like the value per statistical life is a measure of own preferences for own outcome. So that's how much money would I spend to improve my health a little bit, and how much would you spend to improve your own health a little bit. That doesn't say anything about, in a deeper sense, the value of your life or of mine. So that's a terminology thing that we fall into. Um, and secondly, one way I think about a lot of this evaluation is, as individuals, we appropriately defer to governments and others to make tons of decisions on our behalf, product safety standards, regulation, um, many, many, many things. And it's appropriate because the world is so complex, we don't have the time or knowledge to investigate even a tiny fraction of these choices that are relevant to our well-being. So then the question is, what guidance do we want to give the government or a foundation that wishes to intervene to improve our welfare. And some formulation of the consequences and taking account of the preferences of the affected people over those consequences seems to me to be a very good input to it. Yeah, it's, uh, Jack Kinnant, Simon Fraser University. Um, not surprisingly, uh, I want to take you back to the thing you skipped over uh, fairly rapidly, and that the project seems to have written off, and I just wondered whether there's a possibility of bringing back, and that's the issue of the choice between WTA and WTP. Now, for the benefit of uh, everyone here, uh, there's an awful lot of evidence suggesting that these differences are not small, they're huge, and Jim has compiled a uh, uh, mega analysis suggesting that the differences are of the order of three or four or five times. In other words, the how much you have to pay people to accept the loss is three or four or five times larger than how much they're willing to pay to prevent a, or for a gain. And in the health issue, um, a lot of the changes are uh, reducing losses. And if they're reducing losses, then WTA is the proper measure of it. If it is the proper measure, and if it turns out that these are reduces, that the interventions are primarily considered by the people that benefit from them as um, reductions of losses, then the insistence on using WTP to measure them 
is going to create a huge bias. And I just wonder whether this project, rather than write, write this off, seems to be the, this is a chance to look into this a bit more. And uh, instead of writing it off, because if we're, if we're talking about underestimating the uh, benefits of health interventions by you know, a factor of five or four or whatever it is, uh, this seems to, you know, this is more than a rounding error here. You know, something yeah. we might so, want to consider. Um, and I, I just wonder whether this project might look into it. So I hope we're not writing it off, and I didn't mean to suggest we're writing off that difference. In fact, I said the two are different conceptually, and for sure in some cases, quantitatively big. Um, another issue is it gets to the point about whether people are making well-informed, well-considered choices, and whether we're estimating them accurately. I think a lot of the big differences that you and I both know about are errors on people's evaluation in their evaluation. So we don't want policy based on error to the extent we can avoid that. Um, and finally, if you take a simple case where it's the people's own money and their own change in outcome, it seems like they either have to prefer X amount of money and the change in outcome or the opposite of that. And whether you frame it as willingness to pay or willingness to accept, if that does affect the outcome, that's a logical inconsistency. No, no, I agree with that. Uh, my point was we don't want to make policy on the basis of the errors that economists make in choosing either. That's right. Absolutely. Uh, Bob Plotnick, University of Washington. This is sort of related to the last comment. You know, the idea of saying people are the most the legitimate judges of their own welfare is very appealing in many cases, and yet we, it's well known they very badly misperceive small probabilities. And in a lot of these interventions you're talking about, can be talking about small prob changes in probabilities, and they may vastly overestimate the, the consequences or, or underestimate the consequences. So I'm just wondering, it's, how do we deal with that? That's right. So often I put up a slide that I didn't use here, which is about <clears throat> the role of government. So I mentioned rational ignorance and things like that. And there are two great quotes that characterize this. Thomas Jefferson said, the third president of the US, writer of the Declaration of Independence, when we think people are not sufficiently wise to exercise discretion well, the remedy is not to take the power from them, but to educate them. Edmund Burke, a Irish British statement, statesman, said, your representative owes you not only to follow your wishes, but to exercise his own judgment. And you know, we've seen a lot of criticism of politicians focus grouping everything, following polls, just trying to stay in front of the parade. And we actually do want our leaders to exercise leadership, not just to try and mimic whatever whims and passions consume us at the moment. So that's a deep and fundamental tension. And greater people than I have not solved it. 